Check, check. Pior, can you hear my voice? Yes, I can. I can. Salamat okay. siang. Oh. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. So uh, just wait for a minute. Probably there are more students will join my uh, class here. And by the way, I also actually posted the poster for uh, other students. So uh, maybe later on, some of them actually join, uh, uh, mm -hmm. how do we call it, uh, online. Because at the moment, uh, I have 20 plus students with me here. Most uh -huh. of them, or not most of them, all of them actually postgraduate students. And uh, <clears throat> we will have a lecture this afternoon. So uh, I'll ask them to uh, attend this uh, lecture first uh, with you. But uh, let us just wait for a couple of minutes before some of them actually uh, will join us. What's time there now in your side? Uh, it's almost eight o'clock in the morning. So how many hours difference? I think it's a proper um, five hours. Five hours, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you, so you just got finished your uh, breakfast then? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm having coffee <laughs> for my breakfast. How are you? How, how about you guys? Are you? What, what's the well, tradition? We just finished our breakfast? lunch anyway. All oh, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Lunch. Lunch. yeah. Okay. Okay, Pure, I, I think we can just, right? Uh, and then a couple of students maybe will uh, join us later on. So again, thank you very much, Pure. Uh, and also thank you very much for my uh, students who are with me now. There are about uh, 23 students who are with me now, uh, Pure. And then of course, as I said to you yesterday, I also posted this, uh, how do we call it? A flyer for this, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, lecture uh, to other students and then uh, let's see whether they can join online later on but again thank you very much Pior and uh, of course I always uh, you know afraid of uh, pronounce your name uh, incorrectly so please uh, introduce yourself to uh, my students a little bit later on uh, and then of course, uh, of course uh, just for information uh, to my students Pior actually uh, he's now so, where is your position now? In Bulgaria or in Poland? No, I'm based in Sofia, Bulgaria. Okay, uh, so currently. Here. So, tell us a little bit uh, later on. So, Pure actually working with me, although online, as uh, how do we call it? Yeah, uh, Pure. Uh, uh, what is your status with Erlanga at the moment? <laughs> I forgot. Well, it my, my status is a postgraduate fellow. And, yes. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, sure. It's it's uh, incredible to uh, look at the uh, international conflict from different perspective. Sure. Uh, sure. That's why that's why we are here. I've adjusted a little bit my view about certain conflicts when sure. you when you look it, look at it from from different perspective, and that that's the that's the beauty of it. Sure. Uh, so uh, today's lecture. Uh, is dedicated to Indonesian response to uh, Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, and it is a broader project uh, dedicated to Indonesian uh, foreign policy and the policy towards Russian conflict and China's expansionist actions in Southern uh, Ch China Sea, Pacific Ocean and o Oceania. Uh, so um, this is uh, um incredible opportunity for me. So thank you very much, Professor uh, Dugis. Thank you very much to the Faculty of Social and Political Science. And uh, thank you to the rector of the university and also the administrative st staff for, for allowing me to, to pursue my uh, research. Um, basically today, uh, today we will uh, basically have uh, three parts of this lecture. Uh, the first part will be dedicated to Western perspective and uh, uh, Western policymaker, IR theorists, and various uh, geopolitical schools. So we'll, we'll approach Ukrainian conflict from, from the European and American perspective a bit in the beginning. And then we'll switch to uh, various peace initiatives uh, that are launched or have been launched uh, ever since February 
2022 and basically February 2014 as well, because the uh, Ukrainian conflict uh, has started not in 2022, but uh, before, long before that. And the third, the main part will be dedicated to uh, Indonesian experience in resolving international conflict uh, through the prism of various multi-track diplomacy initiatives dedicated to uh, current Ukraine. So uh, and when I will talk about Indonesian history, and if I say something terribly incorrect, please stop me and correct me. And if you have any questions, please stop me at any point as well. I dedicated the question and answer session uh, to the end of this presentation, but still, if you have anything, if you want to clarify something, please stop me. I, I will gladly respond to any questions. A few words about me, because uh, uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Ayanga University. Uh, I'm also a researcher with a background uh, in political philosophy, conflict resolution strategies or conflict management strategies, uh, depending how you look at it. Uh, from European perspective, we still believe that there is a conflict resolution strategy. Americans already want to manage conflicts. Uh, I'm, I have strong interest in IR theory. Uh, geopolitics, geoeconomy, uh, international relations in general, and security studies, humanitarian uh, studies. Um, basically, that would be a general introduction about myself. Uh, I want to acknowledge that Indonesia has a long tradition of the diplomatic and conflict management uh, skills. Uh, various initiatives have been um, highly regarded around the world and i want to uh, touch upon that in the third part of the presentation um when we when we start talking about international conflict and i don't want to uh, repeat the same information which is on the media about ukrainian conflict because everyone in the classroom now knows when ukrainian conflict started and how how it's uh, basically being per perceived by by various media outlets and uh, what's the difference between um, Ukrainian, American or Russian approaches to the conflict, but we'll touch upon that. Uh, I want to acknowledge that when we uh, when we look at it from global perspective, uh, we live in the for the first time in the uh, human history that almost all mankind is politically aware, politically activated and politically conscious. And this has brought a further perception uh, in global power, the global architecture of power, because uh, predominantly all of the policymakers in the world uh, either speak English language or, or publish in English language. So uh, we have immense opportunity to basically to adjust to different perspective or look at the look at the world from different lenses, basically. And uh, that's the reason for today, basically today's presentation. When it comes to Ukrainian conflict, uh, there is a lot of uh, different perspectives because it depends how we approach the conflict, whether we uh, look at it from the perspective of uh, beginning of the conflict in 2022, uh, in 2014, or whether we acknowledge that uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine became independent in 1991. Uh, and, uh, and those dates, which you can see on the screen now, are quite important because uh, in 2014, Russia annexed uh, Crimea. And in the following years, uh, it started its uh, operations in eastern Ukraine. Um, but the actual uh, recent confrontation, the recent uh, full-blown war escalated in February 2022. So... So during the period between 2014 and 2022, there was a lot of things which were unreported by Western media. Uh, certain things uh, have been heavily reported by Russian media in, in general. Uh, but uh, there are important dates in Ukrainian history which we need to acknowledge. For instance, the 1986, when Ukraine was still a member of the uh, Soviet Union or was... Uh, a part of Soviet Union, there was a, a nuclear disaster in Chernobyl, which uh, basically uh, contributed to the dissolution of Soviet Union. 
the mishandling of this uh, crisis back then uh, resulted in uh, immense um, problems of credibility to Soviet's um, policy making office, the Kremlin, basically. In 1954, um, Soviet Union officially um, gave Crimea to Ukraine. Uh, and it was the decision reached by uh, by the Soviet po uh, Politburo, and no one had problem with that. Uh, and then in 2014, 2022, Russia came to understanding that it's actually its territory. So um, it's like one of those uncles who gives you sweets, but then takes it back. Uh, but again, we will we will touch upon that uh, during this presentation. Very important period in Ukrainian history uh, was between 1943, 1944. That's when uh, Ukraine uh, committed certain crimes and atrocities in Vowen region. Uh, and that's when um, Ukrainian leadership under Stefan Bandera uh, was uh, basically uh, collaborating with Nazi Germany. Back then, uh, Germany invaded Soviet Union uh, and um, basically um, in 1941 invaded uh, Soviet Union and Ukraine tried to gain independence thanks to German support. But these uh, attempts have failed uh, and after that uh, some members of Ukrainian nation joined uh, Soviet army, the Red Army, and marched towards Berlin. Uh, the others were still collaborating with Germany, so that's why there is a lot of uh, a lot of media attention regarding to this to this period, especially in Russia. Russians still perceive Ukrainians as uh, semi-fascist collaborators, and that's the that's the uh, reasons why they gave for the uh, outbreak of the intervention or. Uh, the full-blown war in in Ukraine, basically in 2022, which is which is complete nonsense. But still, uh, it depends how how we recollect history. So that's basic uh, controversy when it comes to the Ukrainian history. At the moment, uh, in March 2023, um, both Ukraine and Russia found themselves in catch-22 situation simply because uh, on one hand, if they want to resolve the conflict, um, there is always uh, an issue. They want to escalate war, both sides, as a matter of fact. And uh, basically, when it comes to Russian perspective, uh, the moment Putin stops the war and agrees to Western Ukrainian terms, he withdraws Russian troops from all territories of Ukraine, he basically ends up being uh, removed from power by one of his generals or ministers in coup d'etat. Uh, and he would expose Russia to uh, the time of trouble, basically. That's what Russians are afraid. In the meantime, if President Zelensky of Ukraine uh, stops counteroffensive, because now uh, Ukrainians are uh, basically dominating the um, theater of war, basically. So if he ac accepts the Russian demands and agrees uh, for Crimea and Eastern territories of Ukraine to be incorporated to Russia, he loses power as well <laughs> and exposes Ukraine to further Russia's neo-imperialist land grabs and Kremlin interfering in Ukrainian political system. So at the moment, any uh, person who wants to introduce peace to both sides is on uh, basically in very difficult situations. So uh, it's difficult to persuade either Russians or Ukrainians to, to make some concessions. And let's be honest, this is not only war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, it's the war between Russia and the Western countries because Western countries heavily support Ukraine and heavily support uh, Ukrainian political establishment with the weapons, diplomatic uh, maneuvering, uh, political support. Ukrainians can count on diplomatic uh, support as well. 
not to mention the sanctions, the, the, the sanctions imposed on Russia after 2022 account for the strongest sanctions, economical sanctions imposed on any country in the history of humankind. So um, this is the, this is at least the idea. Do these sanctions work? That's the other question, uh, but we'll touch up on that during this presentation. Uh, basically, what we also need to acknowledge when we touch upon such conflict is the fact that the global architecture of power is no longer bipolar or tripolar. It's more of the multipolar uh, architecture of power. And uh, this also has its implications when it comes to conflict management, conflict resolution strategies, because as long as, uh, as much as West, Western countries want to uh, persuade the rest of the world to impose similar sanctions on Russia, like, like Europe, like uh, US, like Canada or Japan, Countries such as uh, India, China, uh, Brazil, or African countries uh, have totally different uh, understanding of this of this situation of this policy. And uh, also, when it comes to the strategy of resolving the conflict or approaching the conflict uh, from the perspective of American foreign policy and the current administration, the Joe Biden administration, we need to acknowledge that there are various uh, policymakers who influence uh, decision-making process. Uh, from my perspective, the strongest policymakers who, uh, who um, basically have influence of, of our Joe Biden administration are, there are five of them basically. So starting with John Merschheimer, He's extremely controversial uh, IR theorist because he claims recently that uh, the Ukraine crisis is the Western fault, the West fault. It's the promises which the West gave to, uh, made to, to Ukraine between 2014 and 2022 that infuriated Russia and uh, made it ask themselves, uh, may make it ask itself a question whether NATO expansion towards East is uh, something which they want to embrace. And Merschheimer thinks that uh, Western countries are, are to be blamed for, for, uh, for the Russia's aggressive attitudes. You can, you can um, basically listen to Professor Merschheimer's uh, most, uh, I think, um, watched YouTube video why the Ukraine crisis is the West fault. I think it has currently 13 million views. I think that's one of the most uh, popular IR theories in the world nowadays, because when IR theory, uh, theories post a YouTube video, it normally has like 100 views, 300 views. But this gentleman has 12 or 13 million views on YouTube, which means that his views, they are controversial, but they are still strong both in, in the Western world and around the world. Um, the other gentleman who is very influential is a professor, Dr. Kissinger, who uh, introduced his idea of peace deal for, for Ukraine. He suggested that um, if both sides agree to go back to the pre-2022 borderland between, uh, between themselves, the conflict could be averted. It's just that neither side, Russia or Ukraine, are willing to listen to Dr. Kissinger simply because Russians have already um, annexed more territories and they are not interested in giving up uh, the eastern territories of Ukraine. And Ukrainians want to regain the full territorial integrity. So they want to regain eastern parts and Crimea. So no one is interested in um, Dr. Kissinger's uh, peace plan. And it is quite a reasonable peace plan, as a matter of fact. Um, the other policymaker who has a strong, um, who is strongly favored by the Joe Biden administration is 
uh, George Kennan and his policy of containment. So he basically, he was an ambassador to Soviet Union um, during and after the Second World War. And uh, he came up with the idea that uh, the Western countries cannot defeat communism, so they need to contain it. And they need to contain it through various uh, geostrategic uh, policies, which are aimed at stopping the uh, USSR and uh, China's expansionism by uh, creating a blockade. The whole Rimland area here, China, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, uh, Middle East and Western Europe was about to be uh, strengthened by American foreign policy in order to stop the communist expansion. And the same the same containment policy was up, uh, up basically adopted by the Truman administration and uh, it's coined as a Truman Doctrine. And the same Truman Doctrine is basically used by Joe Biden administration to, to Russia. So currently Joe Biden uh, and, and his uh, uh, staff, his advisors uh, suggest that you need to show strong, uh, strong uh, feast to Russia uh, to to uh, stop its uh, expansionist policies only because the only language which Russia understands is the language of power. So that's that's one of the uh, containment containment policy. The other very uh, famous IR theorist is Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, when we approach his uh, Brzezinski doctrine, it's basically a ref reformulation of um, of Kennan's policy. It's, uh, he built on that and he added uh, extra emphasis on supporting um, civil societies in the countries that are affected by, by uh, Soviet expansion, by Russian expansion. So the Brzezinski's uh, idea would be to support, um, support both um, the peaceful parties and the parties which are uh, interested in uh, stopping Russia by uh, using hard power policies. So basically, um, he was supporting Mujahideens during the uh, Soviet-Afghan war between 1979 until 1988. Uh, and um, he thought that that was the, the best uh, policy forward. So by, by extension, Biden uh, thinks because of because of Brzezinski's doctrine that by supporting Ukraine by sending to Ukraine heavy equipment, Russia will be stopped and contained basically. So the other uh, gentleman who is interesting, he's not IR theorist, but he's uh, more of the uh, philosopher, uh, political thinker, and uh, cultural uh, scholar basically. Uh, is uh, Mr. Giedroyc, Jerzy Giedroyc, who came up once with the idea, I mean, some people disagree, uh, but um, his political thinking evolves around this notion of um, equating that uh, basically without an independent Ukraine, there cannot be independent Poland. And by extension, without an independent Poland, there cannot be independent Ukraine. And by extension, without strong, independent and united Europe, there cannot be independent Ukraine. So this, uh, this type of political thinking underpins the Western policymakers, um, basically ideas about, about the conflict, how to approach it. Uh, if Russia is stopped in Ukraine now, um, Russia will not expand to different countries such as Moldova, Baltic states, Poland, next germany i mean i mean this is a little bit a uh, political uh, science fiction uh, thing because uh, countries such as baltic states poland uh, slovakia hungary are already members of nato so i don't think that putin would attack uh, those countries because from the perspective of uh, my observations he attacks only the countries which are weak or with weaker political system um, and this is something which which uh, one should take into consideration. But this type of uh, thinking is very 
uh, persistent and uh, the White House currently is strong into, into uh, picturing the world through this perspective. Um, also, when we talk about Ukraine conflict and the American foreign policy towards, towards this conflict, we need to take into consideration that any president, any US president would be influenced by four types of uh, leadership. American type of leadership, basically. And that's according to Professor uh, Walter Russell Mead, the US uh, pres uh, pres president's perception of global re reality at hand may be affected by either Alexander Hamilton, uh, Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Jefferson, or Andrew Jackson. And basically, Hamiltonians express the need for the global foreign policy by promoting economic development and the interests of American business at home and abroad. The Wilsonians. Wilsonians share a belief with Hamiltonians on the need for the global foreign policy, but see the promotion of democracy and human rights in the core elements of American foreign policy. Jeffersonians. Jeffersonians generally believe that America serves its values best by uh, practicing democracy at home, if possible, they tend to reduce their country's cost and risk overseas by limiting American uh, national uh, involvement. Jacksonians, the last group, Jacksonians are usually suspicious of Hamiltonian business, Wilsonian strength, and Jeffersonian weakness. So um, we are ahead of American uh, presidential elections in 2024. Uh, and the new president of American uh, uh, United States will will start uh, his office in 2025. So this will uh, have an impact on the situation in Ukraine. But we'll touch upon that. Uh, basically, Biden, Joe Biden, also follows a bit of Obama's policy, but he does not follow Obama policy when it comes to the Ukrainian conflict because. When it comes to Ukrainian conflict back in 2014, um, Barack Obama was uh, a little bit uh, detached. He didn't do much to, to uh, stop uh, Russian aggression or, or uh, show some hawkish attitudes towards Russia. So uh, Biden is an old crimino criminologist who is heavily influenced by the Cold War era thinking in this respect. Uh, basically, um, in the last speech, which uh, Joe Biden made in Kiev uh, just uh, on 23rd, I think, of February, 24th of February, he suggests that US and its allies will support Ukraine as long as it takes. And this as long as it takes has been heavily accented, basically. And um, there is a basic, um, the policy in this respect uh, has actual implications to the reality at hand and the change into uh, the way Ukrainians and Russians uh, will approach their future peace initiatives. Because if Ukrainians, know that they are supported by US and the West as long as it takes, they would be less inclined to negotiate. In the meantime, Russians, Russians are extremely proud people. And if Americans say, we'll support Ukraine as long as it takes, that means that the Russians will invade Ukraine as long as it takes. Even if that means that they wouldn't be able to feed their families, they will keep invading Ukraine. They will prioritize arms over butter for a forestable future. So this is a Cold War type of thinking. And um, this Cold War type of thinking has an actual um, reality. Um, it, it translates into a cash, basically, support because uh, United States, the EU countries, United Kingdom, Germany, Canada, Poland, France, and Norway have donated to Ukraine trillions of dollars, billions, trillions of dollars, 
over the course of the last 12, 13 months, if not longer, because ever since 2014, Ukraine got immense support, financial, diplomatic, military support to continue this fight. Because uh, if the West would not do anything like in, in respect of Georgia in 2008, there would be no Ukraine by now. Ukrainians are very brave and they are resisting very, uh, very uh, strongly. But the reason why why they are succeeding is thanks to the support, humanitarian assistance they, they receive. And that's the reality on the ground, basically. Uh, and that's 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 a basic introduction to the Ukrainian conflict from Western perspective. Uh, the question which I would like to ask um, is, um, okay, why the West is supporting Ukraine to the to such an extent, but it did relatively little to support um, or to resolve conflict in Ethiopia, Syria, Nagorno Karabakh, uh, or in Sahel countries. Why are we so uh, interested in resolving uh, Ukraine conflict, basically, and not any other conflict in the world? This is, this is on the one hand, again, um, the relic of Cold War thinking, because we see Ukraine as a um, semi-periphery of the Western world, whereas the other countries which are away from the main um, main discourse are left um, untouched, basically. And this is something which, which uh, definitely uh, we should be asking the West ourselves more often. The other question which I would like to ask, or which I would like to uh, point out to, is the fact that Donald Trump, who is... Uh, who was known for isolationist policies. Um, Donald Trump um, might be coming back to the White House in 2024, 2025. So the policy of as long as it takes may be uh, changing, may be evolving at one point. And this is something which uh, Ukrainian decision makers and Russian decision makers are actually strongly taking into their consideration. And um, can I ask you if you hear me? Because I can see that there are some issues here. We can we can still uh, hear your voice clearly. Okay, great. So basically, uh, let us continue. Um, the nature of the controversy, which I would like to discuss uh, also. Um, is the fact that the Western world, America and uh, NATO allies, uh, wants to push uh, and punish Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, for his aggression in, in Ukraine. Uh, and the Western policymakers expect that everyone will be on the same page when it comes to the way we approach this conflict. But um, on one hand, it is the double whammy policy because punishing Russia um, and impacting, sanctioning Russia has a direct impact on European economy. Because as a, as a um, retaliation, uh, Russia, for instance, uh, cuts down on its uh, oil and gas supplies. Uh, many Western countries decided to abandon buying from uh, Russia in general, uh, but uh, this is a policy which is definitely um, not everyone can afford such a policy. And uh, according to Western policymaker, uh, buying uh, oil and gas and coal from Russia it's like financing uh, Russian expansionist policies uh, in Ukraine. The only problem is that the, the same policy has not been applied 
ever since 2014, ever, ever since the annexation of Crimea. It started being applied recently, ever since uh, February 2022. Some NATO countries, like France, for instance, even uh, were selling uh, arms to Russia when there was the first sanction regime imposed on, on this country uh, after the annexation of Crimea. Uh, the, also, uh, the, the other nature of controversy is that uh, the project of sanctions uh, supported by the Western countries is not supported or is not uh, welcomed by the rest of the world. Uh, this this uh, could be seen in the G20 because um, only a proportion of countries, uh, Western countries belong to the G20 group. The rest of the world is kindly has, uh, has, has, has hesitant uh, and when it comes to the applying the same type of policy. Surely, um, countries such as China, India, and African countries and Latin American countries, um, they don't perceive uh, the same uh, type of policy, the Western policy, as applicable when it comes to the relations with, with, Ru with Russia, their relationship with Russia. Um, some took um, neutral stance when it comes to this, uh, this war, such as, for instance, China and India in general. Some are uh, actively pro-Russian, like uh, Iran, um, also Syria uh, and Belarus, surely. So, so there is no uh, common ground when it comes to applying sanction regime to uh, on Russia, basically. So this is something which is uh, which is which needs to be taken into consideration when it comes to building the structured strategy of containment against Russia. For instance, uh, China. The Chinese government refused to condemn Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, repeated some of the Russian propaganda in the disinformation about the war. Who started the war and why? Why was it? Uh, why was it there in the first place? India, uh, despite of the Western insistence, refused to um, say to um, to Russia that this is this is a war of aggression basically uh, when it comes to uh, india in, in particular its internal uh, its external minister uh, dr uh, jashan kar uh, one of the most influential ir thinkers in in the world at the moment uh, suggested that europe problems are not the world's problems and when he was asked about profit, profit, uh, profiteering from from Russia and from the situation when uh, India is basically buying uh, nine times as much oil as it used to before before February 2022, uh, he responded in such a way: India, India probably buys less oil from Russia in a month than we than what Ukraine does in one afternoon which is factual correct, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, when asked, when pushed about, about, uh, about Russian response to, to uh, uh, or the Russian war in Ukraine, basically he said that he does not submit to Western judgment. Uh, and from his perspective, friends don't always have to agree with, with each other, but friends do have to have a core shared agreement uh, which he thinks uh, is gradually getting there. We're certainly cooperating much more with the Western countries compared to just a few decades ago. Um, but basically, he, he, he suggested that India will pursue its own policy towards, towards Russia, and uh, it doesn't need to condemn uh, Russian actions for, in Ukraine, because that's the... Indian national interest we're talking about. Uh, China came up with the peace plan recently that uh, was welcomed by, by Russia. Um, Chinese peace deal suggested that uh, the territorial integrities of the countries should be, uh, should be uh, respected. And uh, China suggested um, basically that 
there should be a buffer zone between uh, the West and, Ukraine, uh, and, and Russia. And this buffer zone should be Eastern territories of Ukraine. Uh, the spokesman of Russian Foreign Affairs, uh, Ms. Maria Zakharova, suggested that they value um, Chinese proposal. It's just that this is a declaration which is uh, which is a diplomatic response to the diplomatic suggestion, basically, because in my part of the world, we still remember in Eastern Europe that Putin. Uh, during the Munich conference in 2007, suggested that the breakout, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. And that means that Russia is not interested in uh, preserving its uh, peaceful or being a peaceful uh, political actor. Russia is interested in uh, gaining more territories or and uh, basically restoring its former glory, which means that Russia is interested in gaining these territories, like uh, the territories of previous uh, Warsaw Pact. So no, uh, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia back then, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and uh, maybe also some Balkan states. So that's that's def definitely, and oh, of course Moldova. So that's that's in the uh, Kremlin's um, basically uh, policy book to to regain these territories. Uh, and this has actual the proof to that is the fact that the Russian army is actually marching towards these territories. And um, yes. Ukraine reclaimed these territories in the north, which Ukraine gained, uh, which which Russia gained in the first months of the war, uh, but Russia is not giving up; it's still pushing along these lines. So, if Ukraine decided to be neutral now and uh, decided to um, say, "Okay, we abandon our uh, ideas of defending our countries, and we don't need the weapons," Russia will use this as an opportunity to gain more territories in Ukraine in general. Because words, words, words. Um, I just want to uh, introduce you to a couple of uh, interesting observations which I, which I have made over the years uh, about certain foreign policy uh, specialists in Russia, for instance. Because I don't know if you remember this gentleman, Andrei Gromko, Gromko Mr. Niet, Mr. No. He was the longest serving foreign minister of Soviet Union, 28 years and 137 uh, days. And he once uh, said that he his free time, how he spends his free time, he observes the map of Europe and he analyzes um, every single region, every single border, because everything is for grabs for Russia. So that's the... That's the Soviet policymaking uh, mindset uh, in the making. So, so this is the Russian mentality we're talking about. In other uh, longest serving statesman, the diplomat, who was a Saudi foreign minister, served for 39 years, six months and 16 days. Uh, the semi-authoritarian regimes, uh, they can uh, afford to appoint um, diplomats and and um, basically politicians for a very long time. This is definitely uh, something which is which is uh, very uh, important to them. But as as much as this is a disadvantage when it comes to our Western perception, this gives them a massive advantage of for these people for uh, Gromkio for. Uh, for Saudi Arabian, uh, uh, Saud bin Faisal al Saud, the skill and the and the abilities which they acquired throughout this period for thirty nine years has the direct impact on the situation on the ground. So one single man, a statesman, can influence uh, foreign policy and decision making process on the ground 
when it comes to the peace process. The same applies to Sergei Lavrov, the current Minister of Foreign Affairs since 2004, 19 years in the making. So uh, when it comes to Russian peace initiatives or Russian expansionist policies, there are people behind it. And we also need to acknowledge it. And we need to acknowledge where that comes from. Why are they so keen on the expansionist policies? It's not only Sergei Lavrov, it's also these two uh, folks, Mr. Uh, Primakov and Mr. Dugin. The Primakov do doctrine suggests that Russian uh, Federation has to expand and it has to preserve its superpower status in order to uh, basically prevent United States from uh, enjoying the unipolar momentum. The world has to be multipolar in order for Russia to succeed. So that's the basic of the uh, Russian decision-making uh, process in the making, basically. The other, um, the other policymaker to take into consider uh, consideration, another very controversial uh, person, Mr. Dugin, and in his foundations of geopolitics, he suggested that uh, Russia uh, has to be extremely powerful and it has to subjugate the former territories which were under the Soviet uh, influence and so Soviet sway. So Dugin thinks that the Soviet Union has to be rebuilt. And this type of, this type of policy is basically very um, appealing to the uh, policymakers in the Kremlin. They rely on these two or three uh, policymakers when they when they come across with the with the when the, when they basically build the uh, foreign policy for for um, Ukraine and and for outside world. Uh, Lavrov and this type of uh, Russian neo imperialist uh, agenda was very much present during the Minsk agreement. Basically, uh, Minsk agreements were um, supported by many countries in the West and suggested preserving status quo in the relationship between uh, between Russia and Ukraine just to avoid any further confrontation. Now Ukraine basically re regrets the fact that they signed the Minsk agreements but this is something which uh, which is uh, which was uh, advocated uh, by French, by German diplomats, and they definitely, um, the same diplomats want to uh, suggest similar policy now. When it comes to French and German credibility uh, to the peace process and finding the peaceful solution to, to the conflict, we need to, uh, we need to also understand and uh, acknowledge that Ukrainians see French President Macron as a uh, uh, Putin supporter. The same uh, applies to Germany. Germany, despite of the fact that Germany is the one of the strongest humanitarian donors to Ukraine, um, Ukrainians uh, don't trust Germans as well because they waited for donating uh, their Leopard tanks to Ukraine for more than a year and they still don't have it. So in other policy uh, peace uh, initiatives uh, which were suggested to Ukraine and Russia were suggested by Hungary and Israel over the course of the last 12 months. But again, Ukrainians or Russians rejected these peace initiatives. Turkey's efforts to mediate between both sides were welcomed and some progress have been made over, over the course of the uh, negotiations. And uh, we'll touch upon that. So one question perhaps which you might have at this stage, after this uh, broader introduction to the conflict from, from the Western perspective, uh, why countries such as Poland or Czech Republic are so keen to encourage uh, Eastern countries to uh, adopt and preserve its policy of containment to, towards Russia? Basically, um, in 1939, in terms of Poland, Poland had a very good uh, relationship with Britain and France. 
and a Polish policymaker thought that in the event of German aggression or Russian aggression, France and UK would come to Pol Polish help. They would support them in the war against Germany. This never happened. So uh, Poland knows that uh, certain declarations made by the Western parties, Western countries, are useless <laughs> for, for historical reasons. So that's why when uh, policymakers in Brussels or Washington declare something when it comes to Ukraine, the skeptical Polish foreign policy analyst would suggest, okay, let's wait for the actual uh, support to materialize because we need to distinguish between declarations and an actual action. In, the, in respect of the support of Ukraine, uh, the biggest support which Ukraine got in terms of the weapons, uh, there was the biggest declaration from Spain, Netherlands, and uh, perhaps Germany. Germany uh, declared that they will, oh, they will send tanks. Uh, Spain sent, uh, said that they will send tanks as well. This never materialized so far. Yes, uh, recently Germany decided to send 14 tanks to Ukraine. Uh, in the meantime, some half a year ago, Poland sent 240 tanks, the post-Soviet tanks, to Ukraine in order to help Ukraine defend itself from the Russian aggression. So um, we need to acknowledge that when it comes to the, to the Western policymaking, the declarations is something, and the actual happenings are uh, basically... Uh, not uh, not so much uh, realistic, basically. Uh, but yes, it is a fact that uh, Poland has increased its GDP to 4% of, of uh, its GDP on the defense spending this year, uh, which makes it the highest current level in NATO spending, I think, after US. So the countries which border uh, Russia or are in close proximity have different uh, standpoint to the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine, then countries such as Greece, Hungary, Portugal, uh, or, or I don't know, uh, Ireland. But still, this is something which we do acknowledge when it comes to West, the West. Um, is Russia a threat to Europe? This is also, uh, this relates to the, uh, to the point which I've just made. As much as countries such as Baltic states, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, uh, as well, um, they think that Russia is the biggest threat to, to Europe ever since the Second World War. But countries such as Italy, France, uh, Ireland, or Portugal don't have the same um, idea, or they, they have different attitudes towards, towards uh, Putin and Russia. Uh, and there is also um, interesting policy which which is uh, which which we need to consider. For instance, why Turkey's peace initiatives were quite successful uh, over the course of the last twelve months. On one hand, um, Turkish policy of zero problems with its neighbors and uh, especially the advocated by um, former Prime Minister Ahmed Devontoglu. Um, this is something which which is which is uh, very credible because um, Turkey can present itself as a neutral uh, negotiator and the party which can be uh, basically impartial when it comes to the uh, Ukraine Russian war. This is something which uh, definitely uh, can be taken into consideration because uh, Russia. Uh, even though Turkey sells the, its drones to Ukraine, uh, it also does business with Russia. So uh, as a matter of fact, if European countries want to uh, avoid sanctions uh, to, uh, to Russia and they want to sell some goods to, to Russia, they do it through either Turkey or Serbia. They sell uh, uh, goods to Turkey or uh, Serbia and through intermediary they end up in in um, in Russia. As a matter of fact, anyone who wants to do business with Russia travels to Russia through Dubai, 
so there is just a uh, one extra leg in in the uh, in in their journey basically so the sanctions imposed on Russia, on Russia are very interesting uh, PR standpoint but uh, do they actually affect the uh, Russian foreign policy making the decisions made in Kremlin I don't think so um one of the interesting uh, peace proposals that could be offered to to Ukraine is uh, a Cyprus solution basically after 1974 um Turkish invasion uh, in northern Cyprus the country is divided to two the northern Turkey northern Cyprus and southern Cyprus southern Cyprus is a member of European Union ever since 2004. So this is appealing uh, to the uh, foreign policy decision makers because uh, it shows that even a country at war can be accepted to such organization like the European Union. And transatlantic aspirations of, of Ukrainian politicians and Ukrainian policymakers are a well-known fact, the majority of Ukrainian population uh, is pro-Western these, these days uh, for known reasons. So the Cyprus uh, solution is, a, is something which can be considered when it comes to peace, peacemaking the process and, and the conflict management in Ukraine. Um, yes, those are basically, there, there are some issues. The, the, the Cy Cyprus uh, peace deal is not ideal, not perfect. But still, it has been working ever since uh, 1974 or even 1960s. The other uh, successful uh, peace proposal after the Second World War was a reunification of Austria. Uh, the Soviets gave up on its on on their um, occupied zone um, when Austria promised that it will never join NATO. And Austria is never, uh, has never been a member of NATO. So Russia did not see Austria as a threat, which is, which is very popular in the uh, Kremlin terminology. Uh, Russia perceives Ukraine as a threat to its national security. And uh, Ukraine, uh, fully integrated to transatlantic uh, bloc, uh, NATO and uh, European Union, would be, according to Kremlin, an existential threat to Russian policymaker. Uh, of course, there is there is an example like Switzerland, the full neutrality. Uh, still, even Switzerland has has its army, and it has the one of the biggest uh, arsenal of Leopard tanks in Europe. And now Ukraine is uh, basically President Zelensky is calling. Uh, the, the president of Switzerland asking for help uh, to sell them uh, tanks in order to to uh, continue with with Ukrainian counter offensive, but that's that's a different story. Uh, in general, Ukraine has strong reasons to say no to uh, neutrality. Ukraine cannot afford to be neutral country because of the uh, country in the east that it shares border with and country in the north because belarus uh, belarus is the country which is actually uh, fully dependent on russia so the russians see belarus as a another uh, foreign territory that belongs to them basically and they see president lukashenko not as a, a sovereign of uh, of of belarus but as a governor of Belarus because uh, Lukashenko does anything which which Putin wants him to so in February March and April of 2022 when Russia attacked Ukraine it also attacked Ukraine from the Belarusian territories from here Kiev is here somewhere so the Russian army basically tried to uh, try to uh, conquer Ukrainian territory through also through Belarusian territory so we touched upon that when it comes to uh, Ukraine and Russia being interested in ending or escalating this conflict. Ending of the conflict uh, is not 
something which both policymakers, Russia or Ukraine, would want. They want they would want to end Ukrainian conflict on their terms, but they wouldn't want to end the conflict uh, by uh, applying some sort of um, consensus. The uh, they wouldn't want to agree to disagree on certain things. So the, the conflict is deemed to be escalated, as a matter of fact. Uh, from the perspective of humanitarian activities, uh, civilians, ordinary citizens, NGOs, international organizations, and countries that uh, basically uh, lie in the close proximity to Russia and Ukraine, it is a vital importance for this conflict to end because of the hyperinflation, the economic um, dis disadvantage which is created by this conflict. It is because of the um, stability of the, of the region and the global architecture of power, which we fear. We fear that this conflict can be escalated to nuclear exchange because at one point when Ukraine becomes too strong, and attacks Russian territories, Russians can retaliate with nuclear weapons. So this is a threat which is which is maybe not something which is conceivable, but no one or not many policymakers believed uh, before February 2022 that uh, Russia would actually unleash such a full-blown aggression on Ukraine, on independent countries. So um, the nuclear strike is not something which is not considered in the in the Kremlin, I suppose. But this is a speculative talk. I don't want to engage in that. But uh, Professor Merschheimer, for instance, suggests that yes, uh, we need to respect Russia because Russia still has nuclear weapons. So, is it rational policy to attain peace through war? They don't want to. Uh, basically uh, find a compromise. They want to attain peace through war. Does it sound like a tangible strategy? This is a strategy which is definitely uh, very characteristic to strategy which is built by the generals. Generals very often uh, picture war as a means to attain peace. For instance, Karl von Clausewitz said that in war, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of single action could only be determined by a final balance. So no matter the casualties, as long as we attain our military objective, that's, that's the strategy by uh, Cold War generals, Cold War politicians who adopted this type of strategy. But are we ready for decades of war? Are you ready for, for the war which goes on and on and on for, for years, decades, and centuries, basically? I, I think I distinguish between warmongers and humanitarians when it comes to this, uh, uh, this dilemma, basically. And I don't differentiate between Russians, uh, Americans, uh, Europeans, uh, Indonesian, uh, Chinese, or Indian policymakers in this respect. Every country has their own policymakers and their own uh, approach towards conflict resolution. But there is another way. Track one, track two, track three, track four, track five, track six, diplomacy. The peace initiatives which could be implemented by uh, by various parties. The governments and political elites can definitely force both sides to, to compromise. The civil society can influence uh, policymakers in both countries to stop this war. The community and the grassroots uh, activists can uh, suggest peace and they can protest against war. This is something which is definitely uh, in the cards as well. At one point, it would be beneficial. It would be beneficial if uh, instead of pursuing the military objectives, both sides, Ukraine and Russia, would uh, try to 
embrace the various peace initiatives, the multi-track diplomacy. Uh, in Ukrainians, the Ukrainian policymakers suggest that they are ready for peace as long as Putin is out. As long as Putin is out of power, they can negotiate with any other uh, politicians uh, who would be in the Kremlin, who would be president, the future president of Russia. Is it a realistic approach uh, or delusional? Can we balance between both? Can we not make peace with Putin only because he is uh, hawkish and um, a very Machiavellian leader? The, those are the questions which are asked. The other questions are that are, are asked are very often asked in my country, in Poland. For instance, the Polish Prime Minister, Mr. Morawiecki says, why would we negotiate with Putin if he's a Hitler? Why would we uh, even embrace this idea? Surely the, there is a middle way. Uh, as a matter of fact, as an observer of the uh, social reality at hand, uh, I've noticed that many IR theorists use the term balkanization to describe certain policies. And uh, balkanization uh, is a term which, which suggests that uh, um, basically, um, basically, um, Simply because there is so much, so there was so much conflict and so much uh, war in the Balkans in the 1990s. Um, the Balkan region is uh, inherently um, deemed to uh, continue uh, achieving their 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 goals through through war and and uh, conflict. But this is no longer the case. That was 20, 30 years ago. And uh, the Balkans of today are one of the most peaceful regions in, in Europe, as a matter of fact. Uh, I recently suggested a term Putinization, which is uh, the situation in, uh, basically, the situation in any given country uh, would be explained as both official and unofficial attempts of the Russian Federation aimed at restoring Russian domination, hegemony in Eastern Europe and Asia at any cost. I will send you this uh, presentation uh, so everyone can read that. I'm not going to go into the details. This is, this is an idea. Surely it's def difficult to negotiate with Putin if his army, and I'm sorry for using the graphic pictures here, if his army is using various crimes against humanity, against civilians in Ukraine. Uh, we also, uh, on media, what's happened in Irpin, Hosomel, Izum, Kherson, Mariupol. We also how uh, Russia dropped two massive bombs on uh, a theater in Mariupol that resulted in 1,000, more than 1,000 casualties. This is something which is not acceptable in the modern world in even even uh, when it comes to the uh, conflict there are there are certain rules and regulations of um waging war and russia has committed a number of war crimes atrocities in ukraine so that's the reason why ukrainians and western countries would not want to make a peace deal with putin because of the crimes which were committed in Ukraine. Um, there is a strong talk of crime and punishment. Um, there is a strong uh, debate in, in Europe and in US suggesting that um, basically uh, Russia violated all of the international law and it violated the, the uh, memorandums, accords, and treaties which it signed 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, this is something which uh, is clearly proven that uh, this is uh, this was uh, basically um, um, the 
Russia, Russian state was disingenuous when it comes to its declarations and when it comes to its reality on, on the ground. But bringing Putin to justice um, is not something which could be done easily. This is something which is uh, unrealistic unless the Russian people will decide to uh, remove him from power. Or if he travels somewhere abroad and he's being uh, arrested by, um, by the specially designed authorities to do so, like in case of Milosevic. I recently um, started a project trial in absentia of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. I will send you more details about that uh, at one point. Um, this is this suggests to try uh, Mr. Putin for the crimes committed in Ukraine in his absence, just to practice. If that situation will ever materialize, that would be something which could be beneficial. But it will definitely um, show us the limitations of the UN-based global security system, because. In uh, situations like that, idealism unfortunately loses to pragmatism. And when it comes to resolving reg regional conflict of global importance, pragmatism is extremely important. In this respect, I would like to uh, suggest you uh, the publication of uh, Mr. Philip Gamagelia, who wrote a book about conflict resolution strategies in Syria and Nagorno-Karabakh, who basically suggested that uh basically suggest that uh in in such situations one has to be pragmatic because um neither sides in in terms of nagorno karabakh armenia or azerbaijan they are not interested in resolving conflict it's mutually beneficial for them for the conflict to continue and unfortunately the same uh, observation is very accurate when it comes to description of Ukraine-Russian relations at the moment. Neither side is interested in resolving this conflict. So seizing hostilities is something which could be uh, seen as a uh, temporary solution. The question is who will, who will be a decision maker? Who will uh, make that happen? Who can be seen as credible party when it comes to uh, resolving Russian Ukraine war of 2022. I suggested in my previous publications that even in cases such as Gota chemical attacks in Syria in 2013, the international community has shown a far reaching pragmatism. And despite of obvious war crimes committed in, in Syria, Russia and uh, US agreed to uh, a deal which suggested removal of the chemical weapons from Syria, um, even if uh, President Bashar al-Assad of Syria would, be, would stay in power. This was a pragmatic and rational deal to, to resolve certain uh, situation in in Syria. We need a similar pragmatic diplomatic solution to conflict in Ukraine. And pragmatism means uh, basically pragma from the Greek word, which means work, practice, action of activity. This is not something which is uh, given for 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 forever. Pragmatism means uh, saving lives. And this means uh, resolving conflict at all costs, not through the war, but through compromise. And when it comes to the uh, such initiatives like uh, Kissinger Peace Plan, which actually suggests uh, changing the borders of Ukraine and uh, making, uh, making the peace uh, a reality, is something which should be uh, strongly considered by Western policymakers, because the demarcation of the uh, contemporary borders in countries in 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 all countries in uh, Africa, in the Middle East, even in uh, in the North America, this is something something which is uh, which is temporary. 
yes, the international law uh, expert would uh, criticize me heavily for that. But if uh, changing the borders of the country would resolve the conflict, why wouldn't we try it? So the lessons which we can learn from the Ukrainian war are many. Uh, one of them uh, could be that we need to reform the UN Security Council. So the reforming UN Security Council suggests that uh, the, best, the best reform that could be implemented these days is so-called Putin legs, which suggests that a UN Security Council permanent member state who actively engages in military campaign against an independent country automatically loses their place at the UN security table until an independent international tribunal clears them of the charge of the violation of the principle of state sovereignty they committed themselves to protect for a minimum of 25 years. This is something which, uh, which could improve the global architecture of power. It could uh, resolve many conflicts, the conflict in Ukraine, the conflict in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Ethiopia uh, and uh, Mali as well. But again, uh, I'm not sure whether the global powers would be interested in implementing that because this rule would not apply only to uh, Russia, but it would by extension apply to countries such as United States, United Kingdom, France and China. <laughs> so we are back in square one. There is no solution, there is war. And uh, from my observations, when it comes to Ukraine conflict, uh, the Ukrainians believe that uh, after this war, there will be some sort of Congress of Vienna, which will change the rules and regulations and the global architecture of power, and uh, Russia will be mar marginalized. This is the expectation of Ukrainian side. The reality is that Peace is just a short period between two wars, as, as, as far as this realist approach is uh, concerned. And hypothetically, even if Putin is out of power today, what uh, guarantees we have that he would not be replaced by, for instance, Ramzan Kadyrov of Chechnya, which is even more hawkish, or Yevgeny Prigozhin, the CEO of the Wagner Group, and Kremlin-affiliated private military uh, contractor Wagner, Wagner uh, mercenaries, basically. How can we be certain that Putin is not replaced by a biggest uh, human rights violator or the strongest uh, alpha male who will terrorize the, not only Ukraine, but also the global realities at hand, all of the countries around, around Russia. Well, Kenneth Waltz, the structural realist, suggests that uh, basically um, it's not only up to the leader of the country, but up to the structure, how the country behaves. Countries are not just uh, led by one leader. They are dependent on other states, but they are dependent on international structure, by the individuals, by, by everything which, which can have uh, implications on, on their um, choices, policymaking choices. So the state behavior will be inherently also dependent on history, on culture, on tradition. And when we consider the current hostilities between Russia and Ukraine, and so much hatred in Russia towards Ukraine, I don't think that replacing Putin with other person, with other strongmen, would actually um, give peace a chance of uh, being even considered. Because someone who replaces Putin can be actually more eager to continue with this war. So how to force two parties to a tangible solution? How to force two enemies to um, disagree, uh, to agree to disagree and to end hostilities? How can we do that? Well, that brings me to the main part, the main part of this presentation. 
the roadmap, roadmap towards peaceful resolution of the Ukrainian conflict and the Indonesian efforts to restore peace as an example of impartial party attempting to achieve progress. Sure. Uh, from, from my perspective, what, what Indonesia has offered for the last 12 months uh, could be um, could be a solution to um, to ongoing hostilities between Ukraine and and Russia. Indonesia, I don't want to teach you the history of your country. Of course, I'm just an impartial observer. Uh, Indonesia has a strong uh, history of uh, finding peaceful solutions to various conflicts. Of course. Um, not it's it's not always been applied uh, to uh, internal policy, but uh, Indonesian policymaker um, in recent uh, decades uh, has proven to be uh, one of the as a, as a one of the most uh, skillful diplomats and and peacemaker basically, and uh, you have a long traditions in in this. Uh, because uh, of the way the archipelago is formed, 17,000 islands, finding the uh, balance, finding the compromise between so many ethnic groups and so many regions, and finding a way to unite the whole country is not an easy task in such a, a federal state. So you have, you have practiced the art of uh, diplomacy internally and externally as, as a nation. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, the idea of thousand friends and zero enemies, which is uh, introduced by the former president, um, Su uh, excuse my pronunciation, Suzy Bambang uh, Yathoyo, the widely known SBY. And um, this uh, president, um, it has been highly inspired by non-alignment and pragmatism uh, and uh, willingness to address uh, values of democracy and human rights head on, basically. Uh, so um, this is something which you have inherently um, in your, in your uh, policy-making textbooks. And this reflects on the uh, current uh, style of the leadership of President Yoko Widodo, um, because Indonesia wants to maintain a thousand friends and zero enemies, but it also wants to maintain its sovereignty and, and enhance its protection of Indonesian citizens and intensify economic diplomacy. Um, in, uh, your current president aspires for, her, for, for Indonesia to become a global maritime power uh, and um, find many peaceful solutions to many conflicts around the world. Um, basically, one of his, one of the peace initiatives which are, uh, which were, which are suggested by, by Indonesia is the uh, peace initiative between South Korea and North Korea. It's still in the making, but surely there is, uh, both countries can rely on a strong relationship with, between, in, uh, between themselves and Indonesia, and that has an impact on the policymaking process in um, South um, East Asia as well. Um, Indonesia has been recognized for its efforts to help Rohingya uh, minority in Myanmar and uh, a strong voice of supporting the Palestinian uh, minority in Israel slash Palestine. Uh, so those efforts are a very strong peace initiatives which could be um, which could be seen as uh, textbook examples of uh, diplomacy in the making, basically. Um, your uh, foreign minister, the minister of the foreign affairs, uh, Ms. Retno Lestari uh, Marsudi, um, is one of the first female uh, ministers appointed to this post uh, and uh, has been very active during the um, Indonesian G20 
uh, summit presidency. Um, uh, Indonesia has made a massive impact on the peace process initiatives in, in, in Ukraine. She basically said once that it is our responsibility to end the war, war sooner than later and settle our differences at the negotiating table, not on the bat battlefield. This is a very strong statement, which suggests a different way of approaching this conflict, not the Western, not the Russian way, but an actual humanitarian way of finding the peaceful solution um, basically at the negotiation table. This is a strong voice which should be listened around the world, as a matter of fact. Um, the, the visit of uh, Indonesian president to both Ukraine and Russia back last year, and um, the strong uh, voice of, of Indonesian uh, pragmatism in, in the peace negotiations uh, and in the UN, uh, should be also recognized as a uh, positive way forward for the for the peace. Um, you have your own experiences of uh, dealing with dictators um, and the colonization, because uh, Indonesia has a long history of foreign domination and dictatorship, um, but. You are also the biggest uh, success story for developing Asia. You are founding fathers. Indonesia is founding father of ASEAN group. So, is uh, Indonesia a pragmatic international uh, actor um, or idealistic? Surely, surely it has its. Uh, it knows the benefits of pragmatism. The the recent uh, leadership of the of the country definitely is eager to project this view of, uh, this perspective of um, statesmanship and pragmatism. Historically, there were some problems. There were some problems with, uh, with um, conflicts on the archipelago, uh, for instance, the conflicts in Aceh province, but they were still resolved in a peaceful way uh, by SBY uh, peace initiative, and this can be also uh, shown as an example of dealing with two different parties. Um, so the GAM representatives um, met at one point with, with the members of the Indonesian uh, presidency, and uh, thanks to the support of uh, Mati Ahtisari, uh, the peace on the island on Sumatra has been restored and uh, the conflict has been avoided, basically. Um, the peace agreement in East Timor also is something to be considered because, again, uh, when we look at the, at the um, at this part of the, of the archipelago from the perspective of historical um the beginning of the conflict in 1970s 1976 after portuguese left the uh, uh, island and uh, the island declared its independence um basically the dictator of uh, indonesia decided to invade uh, east timor and the conflict lasted until 1999 so you basically benefited out of external assistance, Australian and UN assistance to restore peace and security to the island. And uh, this surely uh, taught you a lesson that uh, when it comes to Indonesia, um, finding peaceful way of resolving conflict is better than engaging in war. I think uh, we in Europe can sympathize with this uh, idea because Europe is known for its constant wars between countries. Uh, and uh, this is something which uh, definitely could be taken into consideration. Uh, what is very interesting, uh, what shows your pragmatism and the example to follow is the fact that you are even um, pragmatically willing to move your capital from Jakarta 
uh, to East Kalimantan, basically. So uh, um, that is a rational idea, and many countries uh, did that in the in the past. So this also shows the rational spirit of thinking, and um, the new location of uh, Nusantara that is uh, suggested to be your capital soon uh, is a central location for Indonesia uh, and uh, this is this will definitely improve the way of communication between different islands in archipelago, archipelago. so again this shows pragmatism and realism and these same attitudes which could be um trans uh, transformed and and uh, offered to the Ukrainians and Russians. Um, I've recently made an argument that um, your president's um, attitudes towards resolving conflict between Russia and Ukraine, if they were successful, they could turn Indonesia into global play, a player of original player of global importance. It, despite of the um, all of the arithmetical um, calculations, uh, Indonesia would basically join the league of the global players by offering something which is impossible, resolving of the conflict, which is uh, inherently impossible to resolve. And um, what I also in my research found very interesting is the fact that Indonesia can find the balance between US and Chinese rivalry in the region. Uh, you are not only a spectator, spectator of the show, but also an active international player in global politics and a successful uh, international player because um, it's not a member of BRICS or Shanghai Cooperation Organization or Quad or AUKUS, uh, but it's definitely a founding member of the ASEAN group. And uh, it has both the, uh, it accepts both Chinese investment in the uh, rail connecting Jakarta and Batum, and it accepts American military bases in South China Sea. So uh, basically, Indonesia is a rational player in the region, which knows how to balance between two different currents, very strong currents, as a matter of fact. Uh, and from your perspective, from the Indonesian perspective, it's of extreme importance to uh, preserve its neutrality and uh, allow the free passage of goods through, for instance, uh, Strait of Malacca, which is from global perspective, this is of crucial importance. And uh, in general, the geopolitician would say that whoever controls uh, a Strait of Malacca is likely to control the sea and shipping routes of the entire region, but you don't want to control it you allow a free passage of number of vessels through the through the uh, strait so this also shows pragmatism in the and uh, acceptance of the international law which allows uh, free passage through through the uh, through the straits basically um and uh, building a military base in uh, batam american military base and supporting it with the Indonesian uh, military and and uh, um, various um, um, different initiatives would definitely strengthen your, your internal position in general. So can Ukraine learn from the Indonesian experience in a sense that in the past Indonesia uh, agreed to uh, basically uh, independent, uh, peaceful transition to semi-peaceful, let's say, transition um, to independence of East Timor, and it it found a way to 
uh, find the balance between different ethnic groups in in the country. Uh, can Ukraine afford to follow the same footpath? Can Ukraine uh, just give up on its eastern territories in order to preserve peace? The question is, will Putin stop, stop his neo-imperialist policies? And the other question which, which we would ask from the perspective of Indonesian policymakers, how would we uh, allow the food supply chain to go unconstrained, basically? Because the conflict in Ukraine created a massive uh, inflation, the um, high prices in agricultural commodities, uh, such as cereal, sugar, and vegetable oil, they all went uh, higher, not only in Europe, but around the world. The inflation also affected such distant countries like Indonesia. So this also uh, proves that the current president of Indonesia, with his peace initiative, which was launched in 2022, um, wanted to find a way to avert this food crisis. Um, and Indonesia has to be recognized for its achievements in lifting people out of poverty and addressing basic needs for the last 40 years. Ever since the in 1981, the poverty rate has been uh, basically decreased from 70% to less than 10% in 2019, as, as far as the statistic goes. Um, so how to find the balance? How to find the balance between, between these two three, four, five different dimensions. How to preserve the independence of the country, um, the foreign policy and the relations with, with uh, neighboring countries, which could be, which should be based on a mutual compromise and zero problems with neighbors and one million friends and zero enemies. Can we learn from this ex ex experience? Surely the ASEAN is one of the uh, peace initiatives in itself because it resolves a lot of tensions between countries in the region. Uh, Indonesia is also a so-called mean country, the new regional players in the regions, thanks to certain pragmatic initiatives in the past because peace is not being created overnight. Peace is a choice over war. And this is something which Indonesia has been doing for the last at least 10, 15, 20 years. So during the G20 meeting in Indonesia, Indonesia actually managed to persuade the majority of G20 uh, members to put extra pressure on Russia to stop the war. Well, it didn't materialize, but it didn't materialize for different reasons, not because of the uh, Indonesian example or, or the weakness of Indonesian example. No, Indonesian example is very strong. It's just that these two parties, Ukraine and Russia, are not eager to negotiate. So, yes, the war in Ukraine also overshadowed your G20 agenda because you were in, in into projecting three main initiatives during this uh, uh, this presidency: the energy transition towards green energy the improvement of the post-COVID-19 uh, architecture of global health and digital transformation. So this was the three main initiatives of uh, Indonesian presidency. And despite of the fact that you had this strong agenda, uh, just after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine in February 2022, you shifted all of your diplomatic efforts to find the peaceful solution to this conflict. and. Uh, you suggested mediating between West uh, and Iran in different uh, scenarios. You, you were instrumental in North and South Korea in uh, peaceful initiatives. Uh, you visited Ukraine during the, during the uh, conflict and Russia to find a way to, to negotiate, um, to, to, find, to find a way to agree to disagree. Um, you, Indonesia has a very strong uh, relationship with Ukraine and very strong relationship with Russia. 
and he, that is for historical reasons. Uh, I will send you this uh, this PowerPoint presentation um, uh, to Professor Dugi, so you can you can familiarize yourself with all of the slides. But in general, uh, my main uh, finding is that Indonesia did its utmost to resolve the conflict in Ukraine. It's just that. Uh, the road towards progress, towards peace, uh, has not been achieved because of the both sides, Ukraine and Russia. The good thing, the good progress which has been uh, achieved is the fact that you, uh, the very fact that Indonesia was so strong uh, in addressing these uh, global food uh, shortages during the summer of 2022 and initiated the uh, discussions on the semi-peaceful solution uh, allowed countries such as Turkey to uh, basically to uh, uh, force Ukraine and Russia to Black Sea Grain Initiative. So despite of the uh, hostilities between these two countries, uh, both of them decided to agree to allow the shipments of the um, goods to outside outside uh, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea to global markets. So the inflation, the skyrocketing uh, inflation actually didn't turn out to hyperinflation. Uh, and there are obvious benefits to uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative. It's just that the, it was it was reached for a short period of time. And um, we don't know what will 2023 uh, hold in terms of this initiative, whether it will be preserved or not. Um, the geo geographical distribution to uh, to countries around the world uh, of such food com commodities are of extreme imp importance because Ukraine and, and Russia, they produce 30% of wheat in the world, basically. So this is of extreme importance for, for the global peace and uh, fighting poverty, as a matter of fact, to stop this war from escalating. And, uh, of course, UN was part of that, but this initiative would not happen with the, without Indonesian suggestion. So this is a ma massive diplomatic uh, achievement for a country that is so distant, uh, it's not even located in the region. And uh, the presidency of G20 now has been uh, 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 basically it started uh, to be in uh, India. So now India took over the uh, Indonesian presidency uh, and the new G20 summit will be in 2023, most probably um, in the late summer or early autumn. So we'll see what kind of peace initiative India would launch? Because we are talking about the uh, working organism. The war is ongoing, and uh, there is there are many peace initiatives. And the question is, which one will prevail? Because unlike Indonesia, which is truly pragmatic when it comes to, and there is Indonesia has no stake in uh, Indonesia is not. A Russian or Ukraine friend, it's impartial. India is perceived as a pro Russian uh, party at this stage. So I don't know what kind of credibility India might have during its presidency because uh, Ukrainians will not see uh, Indo Indian efforts as something which could be, and I mean, from my perspective, as something which uh, are. Interni, in, interni, uh, impartial. So Indonesia accepted or embraced the uh, notion of enlightened uh, national interest, uh, which was uh, started by um, basic by India at one point. So so Indonesia is currently um, trying to project its power and influence through its diplomatic initiatives around the world. And that, that is all out of my today's observations. So 
please if you have any any questions and i'm sorry that it it took me so so long to to basically get to the to the trace of the of the main topic so i answer any questions now if you have them please okay uh, uh pior thank you very much for your uh, presentation and uh, <clears throat> look uh, i think i should uh, i should have uh, invited uh, friends from uh, Mo Indonesian Movai actually, and they will be very, uh, you know, uh, grateful for your argument because uh, I think for the first time actually, uh, uh, someone who is who happens to be not Indonesian actually, looking from the different side of how Indonesia has actually done something uh, to the uh, war in Ukraine uh, currently, because uh, I think uh, from my observation, uh, pure. Uh, even Indonesia is actually uh, less optimi optimistic when uh, President Joko Widodo, well, by the way, including myself, actually, at some point uh, when he decided to go to uh, Ukraine and uh, to Russia to talk about uh, all these issues, then we were thinking more on our uh, own uh, interest at, at the time. Uh, and then now I think uh, you have opened up uh, our mind to see that there is a possibility where actually Indonesia could be an example for the future of uh, resolution of the conflict that is that has been going on for quite uh, some time. But then to just at some point, actually, you may also consider that uh, Indonesia in the past, uh, apart from resolving the conflict in Aceh and also in East Timor, I think we had also uh, quite a good experience in uh, contribute something uh, in solving the conflict long-term conflict in Cambodia uh, mm -hmm. where we uh, you know our uh, our, our uh, let's say diplomats at the time have contributed uh, a lot of course but anyway of course it's very interesting uh, uh, point and presentation and now I uh, before I start with my own questions I will give uh, to my students here to uh, raise up some questions uh, right. I will go with uh, Vinarto first uh, thank you, uh, Padukis. Uh, thank you, Pierre, for the presentation. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm sorry to say that uh, I'm. I see your presentation is actually uh, one-sided. Okay. So uh, yeah, it 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 told the truth, but I I, I guess it's not the whole truth, right? I. Uh, I quite interested in this uh, topics. I listen a lot to uh, other source of the of the story. I uh, just uh, want to uh, highlight that you didn't mention that in in Ukraine itself there is a strong sentiments uh, from the ultra nationalists, the Azov. Break it right that uh, link strongly to the uh, Stephen Bandera and who are very anti Russian, and that that makes sense. That's why the, 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 the war going on quite long. And then I see that, uh, yeah, I, 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 I refer to Mia Shema, Professor Mia Shema. He, suggest that uh, the war started because the west push ukraine uh into joining nato and that was objected by the russian of course and some say that it is the the, the rights of the ukraine to join nato but uh, i i would like to ask you about the monroe doctrine in the us from the us which uh, ban other country from setting up any military base or close to the Western Hemisphere in the US. Okay, thanks for my question. Thank you much for the okay, question. Uh, are, yeah, yeah. There, are, I think there are two questions raised there. Uh, please uh, respond to that. Okay, sure. So basically, uh, you are right that I didn't mention uh, the views of uh, basically Ukrainian 
minorities uh, because uh, it's limited time. So basically, I could talk about conflict in Ukraine for for hours and hours, as you can see. Uh, I had to uh, basically prioritize uh, the policy making initiatives. So uh, I completely agree that when it comes to minorities uh, in Ukraine, they have not been treated well uh, ever since the independence of the country, ever since 1991. As a matter of fact, before uh, before 2014, there were 12 million Russians in Ukraine, the Russian minority. So uh, when, when the actual uh, President Yanukovych left the country in 2014, uh, he uh, he he left the country back then, and uh, the West pro-Western Ukrainian politicians uh, took over power in Ukraine, and they actually started a very hostile policy towards uh, people who speak different language than Ukrainian. They uh, encouraged very. Uh, an European way of approaching the way uh, Ukraine decided to, to deal with uh, with uh, minorities. And as a matter of fact, it's not only Russian minority, because uh, there was a strong diaspora of Hungarians, Bulgarians, and Polish nationals who lived in Ukraine. So the policy, uh, which was implemented by 2014 new authorities of Ukraine to stop minorities from speaking their language was total, totally clueless and contributed to the current uh, state of hostilities between Ukraine and Russia. As I mentioned during the during my presentation, uh, Ukraine is a new country. Has its historical perspective, it regained its it gained its independence in 1991. History, the Canterbury history of uh, Ukraine has been very uh, unpredictable as well because Russia wanted to exert its power and influence in the country and it jeopardized any transatlantic aspirations of the Ukrainian people ever since 1991. So um, you need to try to wear their shoes somehow. On one hand, the Russians who found themselves in the new uh, country after 1991 were quite confused. So um, because of the policy of the Soviet Union, they ended up living in Ukraine. Uh, but after the Ukrainian regain, Ukraine regaining independence in 1991, uh, they had to assume the new, um, basically, uh, new identity of being Ukrainian. And some of them uh, embraced that. Some of them didn't want to embrace Ukrainian nationality and they uh, remained Russians. Like, for instance, in Crimea, 65% of uh, um, major majority of uh, Crimeans basically were Russians and they had strong uh, Russian uh, identity and they wanted this, this, uh, this peninsula to be incorporated to Russia. Some of them welcomed the Russian uh, annexation in 2014, but uh, it doesn't change the fact that Russia wanted to resolve the conflict through force, not through peaceful means, by negotiations, by finding the way of compromise, by land exchange, for instance. In the Balkans, there is a huge drama going on between uh, Albania, uh, Kosovo and Serbia for various historical reasons. And after 1999, Kosovo became independent or into, into 2000s, basically, when George W. Bush recognized Kosovo as an independent country. But ever since, there were a couple of land uh, exchanges between various, uh, be between Kosovo and Serbia, because some, some uh, lands were inhabited by strong majority of Serbs, some were inhabited by strong majority of, uh, of uh, Albanians which happened to be in, in Serbia. So basically, there is a peaceful resolution to, to such conflict. And uh, talking about American imperialism, of course, there is a strong um, strong uh, theory suggesting that um, Ukraine conflict has been instigated by the West. But it's not instigated by the West, from my perspective. It's an aspiration of 
majority of Ukrainian people who want to join transatlantic uh, uh, community. And Russia is strongly against this plan because it knows that once Ukrainians join European Union and NATO, basically uh, this gives an example to Russian people that the positive changes and democratic government is possible. And uh, autocrats such as Vladimir Putin, who wants to extend his pa power, his time in power indefinitely, are strong, strongly against this uh, policy. My personal view, my personal view in terms of the um, NATO and European Union, I think that I've grown against the idea of Ukraine being member of NATO, because uh, by accepting NATO, by, by accepting Ukraine in NATO, we would weaken the NATO and strengthen Ukraine. When it comes to uh, European Union, I see it as a pos possibility by the year of 2040, Ukraine could be a member of European Union. When it comes to American ambitions and the Monroe uh, Doctrine, this is a topic which we could talk about for hours and hours. So thank you much for your question. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Pior. Uh, I think we still have about 10 minutes left. So, yeah, well, 10 minutes. So I still have one student who wants to uh, raise questions to you. Alpha. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the time, Mr. Dugis and Mr. Peter. Oh, I am Alpha. And I have simple questions. My first question, why the special operation led by the Russian uh, armed forces uh, alongside with the Belarusian armed forces and Wagner uh, private military company, why they didn't complete the operation in a year? Uh, because uh, we know that the Russian, they say they, uh, they can capture Kiev for uh, three days or two days and then regime change, but they failed on that and the war is still ongoing until now, more than a year. And my second question, Mr. Peter, are there any internal of Russian elites who fought each other in the uh, elite sector with multiple different interests? Because I think uh, the war is already complicated with uh, multiple interests, uh, such as like Chechens with Kadyrov, uh, and then uh, Wagner leader and Russian uh, main armed forces leader and airborne leader and so many aspects. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, okay. Mr. Peter and Mr. Tobias. Okay, uh, thank please, you. Uh, so basically, uh, yes, uh, this is about uh, the declarations and the reality, the first question. So basically, there are two answers to your question, the first question. So the first question is, uh, it could be answered by suggesting that uh, because of Western support to Ukrainian forces, uh, Russia did not succeed uh, its special military operation in a reasonable time frame. They, they didn't succeed, uh, they didn't conquer Kiev, they, they didn't subjugate Ukraine because of the strength of Ukraine and NATO. That's one of the explanations. The other explanation, which I favor, um, would be related to the initial uh, objective of Russian Federation, basically. So uh, Russia consists of 17 million square kilometers of land. That's the biggest country in the world. So Russia is not so much interested in conquering more land. I mean, Ukraine land is very good, trust me. You can grow a very nice wheat over there. You can uh, grow uh, very good uh, commodities over there. Uh, basically, everything grows there. It's black land, so so it's agri agriculturally very strong. Uh, but and and uh, some northern parts of Russia, you cannot grow anything over there because it's too cold over there. So so for geopolitical and geostrategic reasons, having more land in Ukraine 
uh, in the fertile land of Ukraine would allow Russia to feed itself. That's, that's a simple explanation of reality. A uh, more sophisticated explanation of reality at hand is the fact that actually um, Russia is not interested in conquering land. Russia is interested in destabilizing the situation in Ukraine in order for uh, Ukraine not to be able to be a member of NATO or European Union by extension, because uh, Russia does not want Ukraine to be uh, to become a member of transatlantic uh, community because it sees, it's, uh, sees such a uh, scenario as an existential threat to its existence. And that's why it's willing to uh, destabilize the situation in Ukraine indefinitely in order to preserve its territorial integrity as well by showing itself as a hostile actor um russia can be feared and if we assume that uh, vladimir putin is a careful student of niccolo machiavelli Nico niccolo machiavelli once said that it's more difficult to be loved than feared so if you have to rule the country it's easier to be feared so if putin is show is uh, ruthless enough and if he shows himself as a more unpredictable and strong dictator he will rule the country indefinitely so that would be my first my response to your first question the second question answer is yes so um, the internal elites of russia as far as i understood your question um some of them uh, see this uh, war in ukraine as something which is uh, completely irrational and they would want to go back to business as usual because western sanctions are basically causing them a lot of trouble they cannot travel freely they cannot invest in in the west they cannot uh, basically collaborate with other partners from 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 different countries but there's also it creates a lot of opportunities for them because uh, Russia can shift its attention towards South, towards Asian countries. And that's what Russia is doing. That's what Russia has been effectively doing. Uh, the, there is a conspiracy theory. Uh, I Normally, I don't repeat the conspiracy theories, but this sounds quite credible. So uh, the conspiracy theory suggests that uh, Russia signed the deal with China on exporting of oil and gas to this country some time ago in 2000s. And it's a very lucrative deal, but Russia has not enough oil and gas to send to both, to West and to, to, the, to the East. So by starting the war in Ukraine, Putin knew that there would be some sanctions and uh, Western countries would abandon their uh, contracts, uh, oil and gas uh, contracts, and Russia would be able to uh, fulfill the obligations uh, to to Chinese contract and send more commodities to, to China or to India, but uh, this is also a conspiracy theory because, like Indian foreign minister said that Europe buys more uh, or used to buy more oil and gas from Russia in one afternoon than India in a month time. So uh, China is different story, of course, but everything can be uh, explained through through geoeconomics. And there are various groups in, in Russia. Some of them uh, see Putin as a stabilizing force. So they see um, surely the, the war in Ukraine as something which is natural, something which, is, uh, which, is, which was expected. The other, the non-governmental institutions, the political opposition, such as Navalny, for instance, they they see the current policy of of uh, russian uh, federation as um basically delusions of grandeur and the police the 19th century type of thinking so it depends how you look at the world I, either you are are you a realist liberal constructivist uh, feminist it all depends how you how you perceive the global reality so to the young students of international relations, I have just one question, one, one suggestion in this respect. Don't accept what you are given. Even whatever I, I said during this presentation, question everything. That's that's the that's the way forward. Well, one of one of you said that my presentation was pretty much one-sided. I completely agree. It was 
one-sided. I cannot hide my pro-Western bias. I cannot say that uh, some there, there was some prejudice here. But, you know, there is a certain uh, background which I have. Uh, it depends on the schools you attend. It depends on the people you meet. And it depends where you live. That's how you perceive the uh, global reality at hand. I try to be objective. I try to uh, entertain different views. Um, but trust me, I'm not as biased or, or as prejudiced as I used to be. I try to be more open-minded. And I, I completely... Um, suggest this uh, object this this objective this strategy to you guys and pragmatism is, is the way forward to to uh, resolve international conflicts basically thank you thank you so much uh, again uh, pure i think uh, i'll take the last point you were saying about the pragmatism uh, because uh, yeah if we, are, if we are looking at the you know the future of the current conflict i think uh, uh your your arguments about Indonesian position is something that we need to cherish and then uh, I believe there are still many issues many questions we would like to uh, uh to discuss with you but uh, because of the time and then of course uh I mean the students who are with me at uh, at the moment they will have uh we will have another lecture at four o'clock so give them time one hour to uh take a rest a uh, moment uh, before then they will come and to talk. Uh, actually, the topic today is about uh, Clausewitz. So I think some of the things that you are already explaining to us uh, can be used as uh, an example in my uh, lecture this afternoon. Again, thank you very much, Pior. Uh, just uh, for your information also, the students who are with me now, there are 24 of them, and they are coming from... Uh, they are all IR uh, MI students uh, who are coming from batch of 2022. Uh, so Great. they are now uh, in their second semester and about to uh, go for their uh, third semester this coming uh, academic year. So again, thank you very much. And uh, just, oh, I forgot one thing. Uh, we are grateful uh, to have this because actually this is the first of the series if you if you see on my uh, posters so we are going to have this year uh, several series of global let's say uh, scholar lectures and you have been uh, picked at the first one uh, for this series so again thank you very much and of course i'm looking forward for your second uh, lecture sometimes next month right uh, as we have agreed and then there are 72 students uh, will be waiting for that topic uh, in the class as well for uh, next month. So again, thank you very much. And of course, uh, don't forget to send me the PPT so I can uh, share to the students who are coming uh, to attend your lecture today. Thank you very much, Pierre. Professor Douglas, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm grateful uh, for your support and uh, I hope to uh, engage in many similar initiatives in the years and decades to come in Indonesia. I hope to join you at your uh, department at one point uh, in presence. Um, hopefully, hopefully, sure, maybe sure. this year I would be able to travel to Indonesia. You, you never know. Yeah. Um, I strongly encourage your young adepts of IR theory to keep keep studying, keep keep reading. If you need any support, send me an email. Uh, sure. I'll try yeah. to do my best to to give you some suggestions, feedbacks. I'm also eager to hear your criticism, and sure. I congratulate these two scholars who, young scholars who, uh, criticize my ideas. <laughs> this sure. is the spirit. We love that. We love that. Okay. Don't don't take anything for granted. Just sure. just be critical. Yeah. So again, thank you very much, uh, Pure, and then uh, I'll see you next month in your second uh, lecture with me uh, again, that will be a pleasure for me yeah thank you very much so thank it's uh, i think it's time for you to have lunch now in your site right i mean that will be second breakfast i think oh, <laughs> second breakfast okay. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock okay okay thank you very much so applause again for him thank you for, for your attention